All right, let's get started. Hi everyone, thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Roland Vogel. I'm executive director of Codex, uh, the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics. Uh, Codex is a joint center between uh, the Stanford Computer Science Department and the Stanford Law School. Our mission is to use information technology to make the legal system more efficient, more efficient for all the stakeholders in the legal system. So uh, we'll have a, a separate session on Codex and the various projects we're working on uh, in two weeks from to, uh, October 28th. And, uh, and we'll be talking about the projects, we'll be introducing some of our fellows, and also talk about ways how students can get involved uh, in our work. So uh, let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, it's uh, my distinct uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, or welcome Professor Harry Surden back. Uh, professor Surden is a law professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, where he uh, teaches uh, patents and copyright, uh, but also applications of computer technology to the law, which is obviously the area that's of most interest to us. Uh, Harry was also our very first uh, Codex Fellow. Uh, he's uh, really set the bar very high for all uh, <laughs> following Codex Fellows. Um, and uh, he's also affiliated faculty uh, with Codex. So Harry, it's wonderful to have you back. Uh, when he was here uh, at um, Codex, he was also, also involved in our uh, intellectual property litigation clearinghouse project, which um, now is better known as, as Lex Machina. Uh, and, uh, and he was uh, the director of the Computer Science and Law Initiative. Uh, he uh, received his law degree with honors from uh, this very uh, law school. And uh, actually, prior, prior to going to law school, he was a uh, software engineer with uh, Cisco and, and Bloomberg. Um, and uh, yeah, so his talk today will be uh, on machine learning within the law, which is an area that, uh, that's really becoming quite, quite hot and is of a lot of interest. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Roland. Uh, so welcome and thank you for having me. As Roland said, I'm a professor of law at the University of Colorado Law School in Boulder. Uh, my research areas are intellectual property law and also legal automation and the application of artificial intelligence in the law. Um, so it's really great to be back here. I always love coming back to Stanford. It's one of my favorite places around. So thanks for having me. Uh, and as Roland mentioned, my, my interest in this area was spurred by the fact that I used to be a software engineer, so I was always thinking about various ways when I was in law school uh, that things could or could not be automated. Um, so today I'm going to speak about machine learning and law, uh, and particularly to the possibility of automating certain tasks currently done by attorneys. Um, so at the outset, before we get to that, let me highlight what I think is the central puzzle of this talk. So uh, the practice of law is often thought to and require advanced cognitive abilities, uh, things like problem solving, nuanced judgment, creativity, dealing with abstractions, abstract reasoning, um, dealing with concepts like fairness, justice, uh, adequate notice. By contrast, uh, even the most advanced modern computer systems have not yet been able to replicate the advanced cognitive abilities shown by uh, trained attorneys, let alone uh, untrained people. So the question is, how can you uh, use automation techniques to automate uh, tasks in the law when machine learning and other techniques have not yet reached the uh, stage of advanced cognition? All right, um, so that's the puzzle we're gonna work through today, and I'm gonna suggest uh, one approach to that. But before we get that, let's ask a more basic question. Uh, before we apply machine learning to the law, let's ask, what is machine learning? Um, so this is gonna be somewhat oversimplification of a very complex field, uh, but because uh, we're at a law school, I think it's important, uh, and I know that many law students and lawyers in the audience who do not have technical training, uh, it's important to introduce the concept of machine learning. So let's begin with a non-technical overview, and uh, it should convey the essence of what machine learning is before we apply it to law. So at a basic level, 
machine learning refers to a research area within computer science studying computer systems that are designed to be able to improve in performance over time on some task. Um, so uh, you're probably familiar with real world examples of machine learning out there in the world. So uh, Stanford and others have famously built self-driving or autonomous cars. Uh, many of them involve machine learning systems to drive themselves. Uh, if you use Netflix or Amazon, you're familiar with automated suggestions about things you're likely to like, uh, movies and what have you that are similar to the ones you like. Uh, you may have used Google automated language translation. Uh, there, in each of these cases, we have a machine learning algorithm performing some automated task, whether driving cars or translating language, based upon analyzing data. All right, so machine learning is thus considered a branch of artificial intelligence because a well-performing machine learning algorithm can often produce automated results that approximate those that would have been given by a similarly situated person and thus appear intelligent. So there are many more contexts that machine learning is being used today that I haven't gotten into, including automated drug discovery, uh, internet search results, etc. All right, but in general, we can uh, summarize the types of things that machine learning algorithms tend to be used for. Number one is automation, automating tasks that traditionally have been done by people. Uh, number two, predictive analytics which is analyzing data from the past to make predictions about the future. And then uh, what might be called data analytics, which is finding non-obvious relationships within data. So for example, it's been found that your credit card score, your FICO score, predicts your likelihood of crashing your car, right? So this might not be an obvious uh, relationship between credit risk and uh, car risk, but that's been determined or spotting outliers, for example, in fraud detection. Um, okay, so that's what generally what machine learning is used for. Uh, before we get a little deeper, I'm going to make three main points about machine learning that will be relevant to our discussion uh, about applying machine learning within law. So number one, machine learning algorithms are designed specifically to learn. That means that they can improve their performance over time on some tasks such as analyzing data or uh, driving, right? So I wanna emphasize this is largely a metaphor for human learning, right? It does not imply that the computer systems are artificially replicating the advanced cognitive systems thought to be involved in human learning. Uh, rather, we can think of this learning as occurring in a functional sense. Why? Well, we often think of, we often measure whether people are learning or not by seeing whether they are performing better at some task that they're practicing on. Analogously, uh, we can consider machine learning algorithms to be learning, uh, in quotes, if they perform better on whatever task uh, they are practicing over time. All right, so this is a functional view of learning, not a literal view of learning. Number two, at a basic level, uh, we can think of most machine learning algorithms as very sophisticated pattern detection systems. So at the very base, many machine learning systems involve analyzing large amounts of data and finding non-obvious patterns within that data that can later be generalized to make useful automated decisions. So think again about Netflix. They're looking through millions of customer uh, in information about uh, their customer viewing preferences and uh, trying to find patterns so customers who tend to like movie X tend also to like movie Y, and then they're gonna match it to the pattern that they think uh, fits you the best, right? And then finally, data. Relatedly, machine learning algorithms uh, generally require data, often large amounts of data. So the ability to engage in machine learning usually goes part and parcel with the availability of data. If there's no data, generally no machine learning, uh, but conversely, if there is data out there, such as there often is in the law, there's gonna be the possibility to use machine learning algorithms to make useful analysis. All right, so let's look at a simple, specific example of machine learning that will illustrate these principles, and then we're gonna generalize 
and apply it to law. Um, so most of you are familiar with email spam filters. This is kind of the classic example that's often given to illustrate machine learning because it's so familiar uh, to people out there. Right? So we all have email coming in. Uh, some email is wanted email. Other email is unsolicited commercial email, otherwise known as spam. So many uh, email systems will use machine learning algorithms in order to automatically classify an incoming email as spam or wanted. All right, so uh, these algorithms work by detecting patterns in your incoming email or email in general and trying to find likely indicia of something being a spam email or a wanted email. So just to give you an example, uh, imagine that an email comes in and you recognize it as spam and then you flag it as spam. Well, you've now told the email program, here is a verified instance of spam, uh, start analyzing it. And the email program can start looking for uh, patterns within the spam. So if the email system has many such known examples of spam, it can start looking for patterns, uh, telltale patterns that distinguish spam from regular email. So in one machine learning approach called naive Bayes classification, the algorithms look for the relative prevalence of certain words uh, in the text of spam and regular emails to determine the probability of spam or email. So let me just give you an example, right? So let's imagine that the algorithm, after examining 100 emails, uh, determines that the phrase earn extra cash or earn cash um, appears in 10% of emails marked as spam and 0% of emails marked as wanted uh, emails. This is a pattern that the algorithm can now use as a predictor. Right? It can predict how to differentiate future incoming emails as either wanted or spam. So they can use such detected patterns to make automated decisions about the likelihood or not that a particular email is spam. So that's part one. So another thing to think about is the following. Machine learning involves algorithms that learn over time, right? So in other words, such an automated spam filter can get better by detecting additional indicia of spam over time by examining more data and detecting additional telltale signs. So uh, for instance, in analyzing additional emails, it might detect that emails with the word free on it are also more likely to be spam. Um, that is another indicia it has now in addition to earn cash. And it also might figure out that emails from Belarus are more likely to be spam. So that's the biggest spam emitting country in the world uh, is Belarus. Um, so all this means is that the email uh, algorithm is getting better and better over time as it's picking up more indicia. So when it just started out, it only had one indicia of spam and it wasn't perhaps that good at pulling out spam from the larger pile. But over time, its design has allowed it to learn uh, to develop multiple indicia. Right, so it can get better over time. By the time it has more of these indicia, it's getting better and better. Um, so those are two main features. Before we generalize a little bit, I want to emphasize something. Uh, I vastly oversimplified a very complex field. There are many more algorithms and approaches than the ones that I just went over. So I don't mean to uh, feel that I've taught you all machine learning in 10 minutes. Um, I just want to make that out, uh, mention that for the computer scientists out there in the audience. Um, but before we get there, I want to emphasize three main points about machine learning and how our example illustrated those three points. So principle number one is going to be uh, data, right? So machine learning algorithms, as the example just showed, require a large body of data, or at least some data that they can analyze. So in the previous example, the data was the corpus of incoming emails. And uh, it was trying to detect patterns in that data. So relatedly, we saw that um, the algorithms are designed to detect patterns. right? So it was looking at the relative prevalence of certain words, like earn, phrases or words like earn cash, uh, that were indicative of, email, uh, of spam. 
and they can use those indicia in order to extrapolate forward to make useful automated predictions. Automated predictions that would approximate what a similarly situated person would do. So if you had a person sitting at your desk and an email came in and it said, earn extra cash, they're probably not gonna read it uh, before deciding the whole thing. They're gonna stick it in the spam folder, right? So that's why we think it's making useful, intelligent results because it's approximating what a similarly situated person might do. And then finally, we saw it's learning, right? It's getting better over time thanks to its very design. So at first, it only knew about earn cash as an indicia, but then it learned about Belarus and free, uh, et cetera, right? So we can think of machine learning algorithms, in a sense, as being able to program themselves, right? They are designed to have the ability to change their own behavior over time based upon uh, new patterns that they detect. And this makes machine learning algorithms actually quite flexible as the environment that they are analyzing changes. So that's another benefit. All right, so now we are in a position to look at our central puzzle that we started with. So recall, we said that the practice of law involves advanced cognitive skills, including judgments and environments of certainty, and the understanding of abstractions, things like reasonableness, justice, uh, negligence, uh, and also a series of what economists sometimes call tacit knowledge and skills, things like uh, creative intelligence, um, fluid intelligence, problem solving, uh, things that are hard uh, to capture programmatically. Uh, but notice what I did not say about machine learning, right? I did not say that machine learning uh, has replicated, nor does it aim to replicate the higher order cognitive processes that people display when they're problem solving the way attorneys do. Or I, didn't, I also didn't say that machine learning does not replicate the learning processes, nor does it aim to, of those uh, engaged in by people. Uh, and in fact, we know that even the most advanced artificial intelligence systems can't match uh, the analytical skills of even very young children in certain circumstances, let alone uh, trained attorneys. So our central puzzle is, how can legal tasks be automated when we have this uh, incongruity? So I'm going to suggest uh, a basic principle here that's going to uh, provide the dividing line and perhaps uh, somewhat of an answer. And that's called intelligent results without intelligence. So what does that mean? That means that there are some tasks that are, when they're done by people uh, involve the use of higher order of skills such as abstract reasoning or problem solving. However, for some subset of these tasks, not all of them, for some of them, you can occasionally find patterns in data that can serve as proxies for some underlying cognitive judgment and can be harnessed to produce reliably useful automated results. In other words, these proxies uh, lead to outcomes and results that approximate those that would have been done by similarly situated persons. All right, so in some cases, you can get intelligent results without intelligence. If you can find suitable patterns within data that are good proxies for some underlying cognitive judgment. Now, I think when I look at a lot of the machine learning systems, I've looked at over the years, I think they're based on this very principle, that one does not have to necessarily replicate human cognition artificially in order to produce useful automated results if you can find useful proxies in the data. So let me give you a good example of this from outside of law, and we'll use this as an analogy to help us understand where this might be done within law. And that has to do with uh, statistical machine translation. Um, so, uh, you might be familiar with Google Translate. So let's think about how people translate from one language to another. So we, we think when people translate from one language, say English to Spanish, um, they engage with the underlying meaning of the words and phrases, and then they reason about the meaning and try and find the suitable analog in the foreign language that uh, conveys the meaning. All right, so uh, in the, so in other words, people use advanced cognitive skills to translate, such as higher order reasoning and language ability. So in the early days of uh, building these systems, 
Uh, many approaches were designed to try and artificially replicate uh, such engagement with meaning due to uh, in by conveying the meaning to the computer and uh, providing this series of rules uh, that either allow the computer to engage with the meaning or at least try to approximate what humans were doing. So these early automated translation systems that tried to engage with the underlying substance and convey it to the computer didn't actually do all that good a job at translating. They would have really oddball uh, translations. Uh, they got you know mediocre results by and large. By contrast, in the last 20 years, there's been a different approach, which has been exemplified by Google Translate, which is statistical machine translation. And it's a much different approach from their earlier meaning-based approach. In essence, Google Translates and other similar systems work by analyzing large bodies of already translated documents and looking for statistical correlations between phrases in different languages. Uh, so for instance, uh, it turns out that there were all these uh, large corpuses of already translated documents, things like UN documents. So it's very typical for a UN document to be simultaneously translated exactly by professional translators into the six official UN languages or more. So there were all these documents out there that had been translated in parallel to have the exact same meaning over uh, many years, and there are many other such examples. So the approach was to analyze these uh, vast corpus of documents to look for statistical correlations between phrases. So if you see the phrase post office on one page in English, you might see uh, the phrase uh, of uh, oficina de correos in a Spanish translation. All right. So uh, such a statistical approach, if you ever use Google Translate, uh, results in uh, surprisingly good translations. Uh, far from what a professional translator would do, but still pretty good. But the notable point, it does so without actually engaging in the underlying meaning or substance of the phrase it is translating. So in other words, unlike a human who have asked what a post office is in Spanish, thinks about what a post office is, and then reasons about what the analogous meaning would be in Spanish, um, these statistical machine learning algorithms have no idea what a post office is, nor do they care. Right? All they have is a set of data with a statistically meaningful correlation showing that Oficina de Correos appears at, uh, with a very high frequency uh, along with post office. So in other words, it doesn't engage with the underlying meaning, abstraction, or substance, yet can still produce useful automated results. So this is an example of getting intelligent results without intelligence. If you can find patterns in the data that can be indicative of some underlying phenomenon, such as translated phrases or spam, that when done by people requires engaging in cognition, you can sometimes get automated results. So I think we can think of this as a more general principle um, for automation uh, within law. Right? There are some class that require advanced cognitive skills when done by people, such as language translation, but you can sometimes detect patterns that can serve as proxies for some underlying cognitive task. Right? So this is our, uh, the essence of the argument here. Um, so let's apply this idea to law, right? just applying the very same idea by analogy, uh, while legal practice often involves abstract reasoning and cognitive processes. For some subset of legal uh, tasks, we may be able to find patterns in data that serve as proxies for some underlying task normally requiring cognition that can produce useful results. All right? So that's the general form of the argument here. So of course, I'm an attorney, so let me start with a caveat. All right? I'm not saying that we can automate all or even most tasks done by attorneys. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, it may not apply to many uh, tasks performed by attorneys, and I'm going to draw some principles where I think we can, where we can't do this later on. So all I'm saying is it likely applies to some tasks that are done by attorneys, and I'll give some principles for telling 
uh, how, but they're not always suitable patterns in data uh, that can lead to useful legal results. Okay, so we'll look at some of those shortly. Uh, so let's look at the application of machine learning within law using the principles I just described and also looking at some real world examples. That's hard to read. It says applying machine learning with law. It's clear on my screen here. Um, all right, so where to find patterns? Well, one place is the large universe of legal documents. Uh, so law is in some significant part all about documents. All right, so much of what lawyers do involves the production, reading, and application of documents to real world facts. So I use the term documents broadly, uh, legal documents, to mean things like uh, court cases, sorry, court opinions, contracts, statutes, rules, regulations, patents, etc. Anything with words on a page that have some sort of legal significance or meaning. Right, so there's a rich corpus of documents out there for which to detect and find patterns that might be related uh, to the law using machine learning algorithms. And uh, this is only just starting to happen. There are some real world examples of people doing that that I'm gonna talk about, but there's a whole many opportunities out there to be using machine learning analysis to find useful patterns. So, um, the most obvious example of this that people talk about the most uh, involves litigation discovery. So some of you may be familiar with something that's often called uh, predictive coding, but it basically is the, involves the automated analysis of documents during the discovery phase. But for those of you who are not attorneys, let me provide a, a bit of context so you can understand how this works. Uh, during a lawsuit, there's a, a, a phase called discovery where each side gives the other side lots of documents. Often these documents can, uh, can run in the hundreds of thousands or even millions. And it's up for each side to look through this mountain of documents to find the 10, the 20, or the 100 out of a million that might be relevant to the point of law that each side is trying to prove, right? So they're kind of looking for a needle in the haystack to find the smoking gun piece of evidence that's going to uh, help their side or not. For maybe a smoking gun email where uh, one party admits that they did the thing that they're trying to prove. Um, so not too long ago, uh, the job of looking through this mountain of documents was entirely done by uh, poor junior associates, uh, you know, sitting in windowless rooms looking through mountains of data, trying to decide whether an email was or was not relevant. So by and large, it still is done by people, but more recently, some uh, parties and law firms have started using machine learning algorithms to help work through uh, aid sorting through the documents, right? So they can do a couple of things. You can provide the machine learning algorithm with a couple of examples of relevant documents, and it can, on its own, figure out what is relevant about the document by looking at multiple examples. So for instance, maybe the likely uh, date range, maybe there's a range of dates that are relevant and there's a whole range of dates that aren't and it can learn from that and uh, filter it out uh, or it might learn other things or you can tell it things that you think are relevant. Um, and uh, in some cases, some studies suggest that the algorithms are outperforming the attorneys for certain tasks, but not all tasks. But no, notice the attorneys are still involved. So at the end of the day, you still need the advanced cognitive abilities of an attorney presented with an email to decide whether or not it's relevant to the law or the facts of the case. The computers are not able to do that with any bit of reliability. Rather, what we can think of the computers as doing is shrinking the haystack, right? So if you're looking for a needle in the haystack, uh, instead of having attorneys comb through a hundred, uh, I'm sorry, a million emails, uh, maybe the computer can shrink the haystack so there's only 5,000 or 500 emails that require detailed attorney review. So that's one example of where machine learning is being applied to look for patterns to automate a task formerly done uh, by people. Um, another really interesting example 
involves legal prediction. So one of the big tasks of an attorney is uh, to provide predictions about legal consequences or outcomes for their clients, about risks, liabilities, the outcome of cases. So uh, one possibility of machine learning is to look at vast data about past court cases to make predictions about the outcomes of similar court cases, right? And it's not just the outcomes of the cases. You could predict things potentially like damages or uh, potential for liability or likelihood of settlement, et cetera. So we're starting to see some work in this area, both from professors and from some startups here. Uh, so a really interesting paper I suggest you look at is one released recently by Michigan State Professor Dan Katz, uh, computer scientist Michael Bomarito, and Professor Josh Blackman called Predicting the Behavior of Supreme Court Decisions. And there, what they did was they uh, took all the Supreme Court cases of the last 50 years or so, put it in data, and ran a machine learning algorithm through it so that it built a model that was able to predict with a surprisingly good accuracy the individual uh, vote counts of the justices and was able to make uh, very good uh, predictions about the outcomes of cases. And it was robust enough that it was able to survive changes in personnel over the court. So, I mean, this is just some early work, but it's likely that work like this could be used to extend uh, legal prediction and possibilities. So that's something interesting to look at. Uh, let's look at some more different trends that are going on. Um, this is sort of the f somewhere in the future and the current. Finding non-obvious relationships with legal, within legal documents. So uh, companies often have hundreds of thousands or millions of contracts. It's hard to keep track of them. Uh, you might be able to do automated contract analysis in order to find non-obvious similarities between in your vast corpus of documents. Or you might be able to find similarities between documents that seem unrelated. Um, analyzing contracts for content. So analyzing contracts and pulling out the different parts. There's some startups that are doing this currently where they're applying machine learning to try and identify the different parts of the contract document and what they're useful for to speed up things like due diligence and uh, contract automation. Um, some other possibilities we're seeing, uh, finding non-obvious relationships among court cases. So one thing that machine learning can be used for is automated document clustering, which is uh, grouping similar documents together by some non-obvious structure. So you might find uh, two different uh, rules of law in completely different areas of law that where the practitioners never see one another. So maybe patent law and family law, they're likely unfamiliar with the line of cases. And you might be able to discover some sort of pattern that unites the two that is non-obvious. So that'd be hard for a person to detect, but maybe not so hard for a computer to detect. Um, one thing, I'm a project I've started at the University of Colorado is using machine learning to automatically detect prior art and patent law. So um, I teach patent law, so this has been an interest of mine. So some of you may know uh, the issue here, but if not, I'll briefly explain it. Um, so as you may know, a patent shouldn't issue unless it's new and non-obvious. And the way that's determined is by patent examiners uh, finding what's known as prior art. And these are generally prior uh, patents or patent applications or journal articles that show that the invention or something similar to it had been invented before. Well, unfortunately, the patent examiners don't have a whole lot of time to scour the entire universe. Some estimates say that they only have 15 to 20 hours to examine a typical patent document in total. So they're obviously going to miss some prior art. And this leads to uh, a problem in patent law, which are low quality patents being issued. And uh, these low quality patents are often used by non-practicing entities, otherwise known as patent trolls, uh, to engage in lawsuits. So if you can improve the prior art uh, finding process, you might be able to improve the overall quality of patents and reduce the problem of patent trolls directly rather than indirectly. So that's a project I'm working on. If you want to talk to about it offline, I'm happy to. Um, but before we get there, let's just 
generalize about what's possible in law. So I think wherever there is data in the law, there might be patterns under there that are indicative and can be used for automation. And I really think the only way you find these patterns is by going in and running them through the algorithms, right? So you have to find the data, run it through the algorithms, and see if the algorithms tell you or notice any measurable patterns, right? And you can do that in combination with some uh, domain expertise uh, in combination with attorneys, or I recommend that you do that in combination with attorneys, uh, so you make sure that you have realistic assumptions. Um, however, back, back to attorney mode, uh, I want to emphasize that there are severe limitations to this approach, right? So I want to say that most of the tasks performed by attorneys I don't believe are automatable in this way, but some are. Right? So I think a lot of the value added by attorneys is not automatable in this way. Uh, a lot of the value added of attorneys is problem solving and uh, providing uh, analysis in environments of uncertainty and fluid intelligence and recommendations and dealing with abstractions like fairness and justice. So there's a whole range, in fact, most of what attorneys do and most of why they're valuable, I don't think this is possible. Uh, however, I do think it is possible for some subsets, and here, here are some of the principles for telling uh, what is or is not possible, I believe, or where it's not useful. Um, number one, sometimes you actually need to deal with the legal abstraction, right? There's no getting around the idea of notice or reasonableness, right? So sometimes you have to take on the abstraction head on, and you're not going to find some substitute for dealing with the underlying substance of the meaning. Recall that uh, the approach here is looking for some substitute for dealing with the underlying meaning. In a lot of law, you're just not going to be able to do that uh, when, maybe when you're dealing with statutory interpretation or contract interpretation, what have you. Another major problem, there's a lot of information that is relevant to making legal assessments that's simply not captured in data. Uh, so it could be we're not capturing now, and it could be captured in data. Or there's a whole bunch of tacit information that economists call tacit information that's uh, information that people know, but they typically don't express uh, explicitly, or it's not easy to express explicitly. So if it's not captured by data, uh, you might, for example, know something about the personnel on uh, a trial board that's uh, informative about the outcome that's just simply not captured by data. Attorneys know these things in many cases, and uh, the computer is going to miss that. Um, you're not always going to be able to find suitable proxies for the underlying abstraction, I don't think. Uh, in many cases, so machine learning requires looking at past data and generalizing and extrapolating forward, right? But if the past data is not indicative in any meaningful way, of the future cases or what have you, you won't be able to generalize. So if your cases that you have are one-off or completely unique from the cases in the past, then the past data might not be incredibly helpful. And then finally, here's one of the most important parts. How much precision is required? Right? So often these machine learning algorithms can give you pretty good results when you don't demand high precision. Right? So you're shrinking the haystack from a million to 5,000, but you're going to make somebody else do the call. However, you would not want to use Google Translate to translate your corporate merger document from English to French. Right? Uh, that is a task demanding a high level of precision, which these uh, approximate approximations are not going to be up for the task. So a lot of things in law require a high degree of precision. And I think as of yet, we're not going to be uh, that useful. So let me say a word about this. A lot of people think that uh, are fearful because they think the technology is going to be replacing humans. Um, so a lot of people think, you know, this has put uh, some junior associates who used to review documents are no longer doing that. But I, one way to think of it that I find more helpful is not about uh, humans being replaced by computers or technology, but being enhanced by technology. So uh, economists talk about this. This is called having a complementary skill set to technology. Right? So it's possible that if you have a certain skill set, that technology makes you better and more productive rather than substitutes for your services. 
And comp if you can use technology and you have a complementary skill set, it often makes you more rather than less valuable in many ways. So I think this can be exemplified by the recent writings of Gary Kasparov. So he's the former world chess champion, and he was famously beaten by a computer in the late 90s at chess when people thought nobody, uh, chess was a uniquely human endeavor and no computer could beat the world's grandmaster. So uh, we were proven wrong. But re so even today, uh, even very basic hardware running advanced software can beat your typical world grandmaster. So your average computer uh, can beat the best chess players in the world pretty easily these days. But one interesting thing that Kasparov notes is that when you have chess masters paired with chess computers, they are unbeatable. So uh, a human can't beat the combination of a chess master plus a computer, and a computer can't beat the combination of a chess master of the computer. So the takeaway is that often humans plus computers are going to be more valuable than humans alone or computers alone. It's sort of a complementary view of things. So I think there's the same analog in uh, law. I think these technologies can make lawyers better it's not, uh, not replacing them because I think a lot of the value added uh, that lawyers give are things that, compute, that are not being automated these days. So let me conclude with three principles for machine, law, the, uh, machine learning and law to take away. Number one, is there data to be analyzed? I think there is out there. There's uh, legal documents that have patterns. There's uh, data about ca past cases and outcomes and voting data, there's data about liability and risk and judgment. There's all this data in the law that has not really been analyzed um, or is only starting to be analyzed. There are some startups out there. Number two, can you find proxies and patterns in the law? I think you can. I think embedded within the data, the machine learning algorithms can help us find non-obvious patterns that can serve for proxies for underlying decisions that normally require cognitive judgment in people, but not always. I think there's a whole bunch of decisions that this can't happen. And then finally, we're going to be looking at, is our past data generalizable to new data? That's really more of an art than a science, as a lot of this is. So there, it's really hard to tell. Um, so I think this is a really interesting new area of law. Uh, and technology. There are a lot of possibilities, many new potential products. I think a lot of people, the data analytics revolution has left law relatively untouched so far. I don't think that's going to last for long. There's no reason to think uh, it's revolutionized medicine and all these other areas why it's not going to similarly uh, revolutionize law and all the data. I think it's already starting to happen and, um, and I think it's an exciting time to be working in this area. Uh, so that concludes my talk. If you want to learn more, uh, I have uh, a paper on machine learning and law that I published in the uh, Washington Law Review. And uh, I'll take any questions that you have. Great. Yeah. You. Questions? Um, hi. Thank you so. for the talk. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk talk about your project on prior art searches and detecting that, the specifics of how you went about it and yeah. So that that's really easy to answer and it's very early. So <laughs> there's not a lot of details at this point. I'm just putting it together. I've just started it in the last uh, couple months. So uh, maybe by next year or two years, I'll be standing here and providing those details. But unfortunately, we're just figuring it out at this point. Yeah. More questions? Hi. OK, yeah. Well, uh, since machines cost less than humans, will legal fees go down? <laughs> uh, that, that is a good question. Um, I don't know, actually. I mean, uh, you would think that it would go down because, I mean, they, you know, a lot of law firms used to make a lot of money charging three, four, and five hundred dollars an hour by having first year legal associates sitting in a dark room looking at documents. They can't do that anymore. So that extra cost must have gone somewhere. Uh, but I don't, I don't actually know the finances, but I presume uh, it should make some tasks in law cheaper.
Hi. Hi. Um, so as the technology kind of moves up the curve and becomes a little bit easier or a little bit more usable, do you foresee the legal industry, meaning the judiciary and practitioners and maybe even in-house attorneys, kind of changing the way they do things to accommodate technology? Yes. I, and you're already seeing it happen a little bit, although with the caveat that law is always really slow to change and especially slow to change with technology. But I think there's going to be, if people start making pretty good legal prediction algorithms, for example, and one law firm or a couple law firms start using these to make better predictions for their clients, I think there's going to be competitive pressure to adopt some of these technologies. Some, some law firms are getting ahead of this game, so I know uh, specific law firms that are doing this. Uh, as for the, the courts, it's, it's hard to tell. I think the courts are especially slow uh, to change when it comes to technology. I mean, if you've ever used some of the technologies at the courts, they're still stuck in the you know, late 80s, maybe the early 90s. So, But I think eventually it, some of this will catch on. Uh, Harry, this is uh, Randy Nickel. Many, much of your comments today had to do with uh, machine learning as applied to uh, what we might say the adversarial relationships, litigation, for example. Uh, you've also written quite a bit about, uh, for example, computable contracts, which are uh, ways to reduce the friction. So from a business standpoint, we're, we're very much interested in lowering the cost of, of basic transactions, which uh, computable contracts offer the, the potential of, of doing. Could, could, you, could you come in and, and tie these together a bit? Because um, I, they seem complementary. Uh, you spoke of the one today, and you've done a lot of work on the other. So yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that they're complementary. I think it is different tool sets for different jobs. right? So uh, when you have some firm structure in place, uh, and it's useful to represent that structure, like as in a contract, computationally, you want to go the logical rules-based approach. And when you demand precision and accuracy, you have to go that approach. However, if you're, uh, you've got a large amount of data and you're looking for approximations or patterns, which is just a different task, you might be looking through uh, you know, uh, 100,000 contracts to find some pattern, then you would go on the machine learning approach. So I think they're just complementary tools to deal with different uh, tasks that any company or law firm might have, and you kind of, kind of have to match the tool to the job that you have. Does that answer your question? The only follow-up would be the, the optimization around people contracts is truly one of the looks at the legacy contracts. So we want to see what worked in the past. Uh, take two business partners that You would look at, want to look, you know, in the same way that uh, an adversarial relationship, you'd want to look at legacy data, uh, per perhaps to find those patterns that you would apply to your computable contracts, so that the co computable contracts will get smarter over time in the same way. That's a great point. Yeah, so they can be complementary to each other in the same task, right? So you can use machine learning to discover rules or patterns that can be useful in the computable. That's completely uh, right. And a lot of... The advanced systems, I should say, out there in the world, not in law, use both a combination of rules and machine learning together, uh, some sort of domain knowledge uh, on top of uh, statistical approach. Yeah. Hey, um, so I'm working on a piece right now that um, analyzes what's going to happen to the legal industry as we go from keyword search to semantic um, driven search. And as I've been doing my research, I'm realizing one of the core problems is, is that keywords are very well understood how we go about operating those searches. We string together a bunch of words, whereas semantic, you put in text and you don't really know what the algorithms are doing. Um, and I, I keep thinking, you know, you can't, not all semantic search is made equal um, and each is different for its applied purpose. So do you ever foresee anything like an association of legal semantic technologists that can kind of sit there and analyze what that semantic search is doing and, and kind of either certifying it or communicating it in a way that lawyers can understand. 
I, I mean, I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, I think it's worth thinking about the idea of standardization. Um, I mean, it reminds me of some of the other standardization approaches that they've had in law over the years, uh, and they often find to mix results that, you know, there's the illusion of standardization and then it kind of falls apart on the corner cases. But I think it's worth exploring, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a related question. So okay. Are you seeing any cluster of businesses or industries acting with a purpose to adopt machine learning? So the law serves banks. The law serves uh, government contractors. Um, how do you see sort of machine learning patterns in in the predictability of those relationships? And uh, yeah, so uh, I have not, I don't have any hard evidence of that, but there's anecdotal evidence that it's happening out there in, in the private sector, uh, especially in some investment firms. But uh, a lot of people are very secretive about what they're doing, uh, not surprisingly. Hey, um, great talk. Um, I had a question about juries, and I know it's a little bit orthogonal to what you spoke about, but um, when I think of a jury, I think of a bunch of sort of weak, weakly learned uh, decision-making systems that are kind of coming together in an ensemble to make a, you know, supposedly a, or supposedly a clear decision about what's going on in a case. Um, but we know that each one of the members of the jury is kind of noisy, right? So is it possible to create or add or augment a jury system with an automated system that maybe works off of first order logic or propositional logic that could you know enhance the way that these sort of decisions are made i think it's a really interesting idea i mean provide the jury with technology to improve their decision making maybe presenting the law in like expert system form or something of that nature yeah i think it's a good idea i think there's a lot of uh, technology that can be helped Use the, uh, help improve the jury process, which on the other hand, I think uh, a lot of us believe that the jury, or there's kind of a principle in the law that the jury is a black box and you throw things in there and then you, know, you shake it up and then some result comes out and you don't look too deeply into the box to figure out what happened. So, uh, but I think it's, a good, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Serden. Um, I was wondering, and you've touched on a number of applications, um, Beyond e-discovery, in the short term, are there any particular applications that you think are particularly promising or that you are excited about? Yeah, I really think the legal prediction uh, is a really interesting area that could have a lot of promise. I think there's some problems in the data out there. Uh, so it's just a big task. Somebody needs to go out there, compile all the data to be analyzed. I think it's out there. It's not just not in great analyzable form uh, for outside of the Supreme Court. But I think that is really interesting, and I think that could really change the law. And I think, ironically, it might make the law uh, both more predictable and less predictable. So if you get these uh, algorithms that are able to better predict the outcomes of cases, it might lead to settlement more, and then the cases that get to the court are going to be the really unpredictable ones that even the algorithm couldn't figure out. Yeah. Yeah. In this very early time for machine learning and cognitive systems in the law, I'm curious uh, about some pointers you might make. I'm developing an online uh, world university and school that's MIT Open Course for Centric. We'd like to offer law degrees potentially in all countries, all languages. Um, you have uh, both the legal system and the language um, that's potentially different in most of 200 and some countries. Um, in terms of data, in terms of um, prediction, in ter um, w where would you focus um, sort of a, a semantic um, sort of data approach in this, l in this amazing amount of uh, potential for pattern and data? Wow. So that, that is a great question. I think a really laudable goal. Uh, I think that's something, you know, uh, maybe I should think about it a little bit and we can talk offline because I think it's a really complex answer. But I think it's a really interesting project, actually. Yeah. Yeah. What Peter said. Yeah. Um, I think we already have companies that have aggregated all the data online. They have databases like LexisNexis. Yes. So they have it all in a format that is searchable and analyzable. And you know, I think could partner with LexisNexis or like companies like these could definitely consider that. 
Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So there is a whole lot of data out there that's in electronic form, uh, and that's good. I think there's there needs to be a little bit more in terms of structuring to make it useful to analyze. But you're absolutely right. I think there's a good head start in terms of data if some of these private companies would partner and open up their vast troves of data. Yeah. Um, if the jury is such a black box, could it be replaced by artificial intelligence? Well, that, that's a good question. So, I mean, in my view, a lot of what law, what happens in law is serving a social functional role, right? So we're not always or even usually in the law looking for a right answer uh, or the truth, um, right? Because a lot of times, you know, truths are socially constructed or we don't really know what the truth is. In many ways, we can think of the functions of the law as a process that we're going through uh, in order to achieve societal harmony. So I think the jury, in addition to being a truth finding, serving a truth finding function, is also serving you know, uh, a societal uh, performative function uh, in showing that you know, you're being judged by your peers and the legal judgment has been confirmed by somebody or a group of people like you. So, my, so I'm skeptical about that for that reason. Um, I was just wondering, and you may not be able to answer this, I was wondering what your, how you may think uh, the legal industry uh, will change after uh, legal technology becomes more popular. Specifically, I was wondering, uh, do you think that law firms, especially the larger ones, may end up adopting uh, maybe a software technology department in order to generate t technology that's more conducive to their firm uh, in order to gain a competitive edge other, over other firms? Is that something that's happening now? And if not, do you think it would happen eventually? Yes, so uh, it is happening now in a very few firms. So I know two or three law firms that have in-house technology departments that are doing things like data analysis and developing tools. So a lot of law firms have basic IT departments, uh, but there's some more forward-looking uh, firms that are doing exactly what you said, trying to get a competitive edge. I think it'll happen more. I don't know that it's uh, that we figured out whether it's totally paid off yet, but. Uh, it, it, and there's some law firms that are going around using it as a marketing strategy, too. So that may be a, a good tool. So you spoke about that, um, the legal prediction um, algorithms and that paper. But I was wondering if you could, at a high level, give us a sense of the nuts and bolts. Because in a way, Supreme Court decisions are the gold standard decisions. You know, they want to be so justified, so they've got a nice findings of fact and background and Theoretically, the decisions based on applying a lot of those. So, what are the kind of proxies that the softwares look for, or that help them uh, with uh, having a good prediction rate? Yeah. So, I don't remember the the exact details, but it is things like you know uh, what circuit does the appeal come from? There's a correlation between some justices and the circuits. You know whether uh, you know is it a First Amendment case uh, or is it uh, you know. Uh, legislative in, uh, interpretation case, uh, are there certain topic areas, uh, you know, is it uh, gun rights or abortion or things like that. So, uh, but there's a whole suite of data out there, uh, all those different variables, some of which are more or less predictive. But I think you're on to a larger point, which is, uh, and this is